going to do something a little different today. I want you to imagine that you are sitting on your sofa, that you are sitting on your recliner, and we're just in a living room, and we're just going to have a little family meeting. We're going to get together and just kind of talk for a little bit. That's going to be really easy for those of you who are on live stream because you're actually sitting on your couch. But for those of us here, pretend that the chair you're in is a couch. What I'd like us to do is we want to talk about just what's going on at Family Church. We're, family Church is a little unusual in that the lead pastor of Family Church very, very rarely speaks on the stage. But he has some important information that he wants to share with you about the direction and the vision of where we are going as a family. So, without further ado, watch this. Before Jesus left earth, he told his followers, make disciples of all nations. He told them, start right where you're at in Jerusalem and then go into Judea and expand into Samaria and then go around the world. Hi, I'm Ed, lead pastor here at Family Church. And we have a rich history of taking those words seriously. We make disciples here locally and we send teams all around the world to preach the gospel. Recently, prompted by God, we have, as a church, taken a god side step in expanding God's kingdom here in Douglas County. We call it the REACH campaign. And it's a $2.2 million initiative that has two different elements to it. The first one is to launch a campus down in South Umpqua. A, a team is being formed that will be the launch team. Events are being scheduled for activities that will happen this summer. And prayerfully, we are considering where we might locate and open up the doors of that campus. So still praying for a location that we would open up perhaps as soon as October. The second part of it is improvements made at the Sutherland campus and a enlarged lobby, a elevator that would give access to all of our ministries and upgraded children and student ministry areas. We are in the process of, of completing the design. We'll have that design phase completed at the end of summer. So here is the good news. So it's a $2.2 million campaign, and we are halfway there in monthly commitments. We have, we have reached the $1.1 million mark, and we are celebrating that this weekend. And there is over 400 and $8,750 that have come in already in cash. And out of 700 people who call Family Church home and are faithful supporters to our ministry, 280 have already participated in the campaign. And maybe you have been here for a short time or you've been here a long time and you've been excited about what God is doing here and uh, here is your opportunity to step in. And we are looking at 500 people who would participate with us in this campaign. And I call it the Faithful 500. And if you would take that commitment card, put your name on it, prayerfully look at what God would be prompting you to do. And maybe it's $25, maybe 50, maybe it's 100, maybe it's more, maybe it's less. But prayerfully consider what God would do and turn that into the office or put it in one of our giving boxes and see what God will do as we continue to go down this journey. One day we're all going to look back at this and, and see the greatness that God has done as we have taken steps of faith to follow his lead. And I hope that you will look back and say, I am so glad that I participated in the REACH campaign. God bless you. How do you guys just sit there? See, I know you're sitting down on your couch. You can't do this, but whoo, I am so excited. Uh, Sky's putting the team together for the South County, and I'm looking at what they're doing to put in the elevator that allows us to use all of the ministry space here. And the idea of expanding the kids' ministry, it's just going to be so awesome. Can't wait for it. So inside your program, there is... Uh, a card in there if you want to be a part of uh, maybe joining into that campaign. You can do that. We'll collect that at the end of the service, um, or you can put it in the giving box if you'd like to. Um, you can pull out that Connect card that's in your uh, program that's a blue one. You can pull that out and fill that out. We'll collect that at the end of the service. Um, so you can, if you want to make a comment on the back or you want to make some notes on there, you can do that. And then also, if you would go ahead and pull out the, uh, inside the program, there's an outline. We are starting a brand new sermon series, and I am so excited about it. It's called Exponential. 
earlier in the year, we did a sermon series called Momentum, and it was looking at the first eight chapters of the book of Acts, which was the early church. Right after Jesus leaves earth, he dies on the cross, rises from the dead, and leaves earth. He leaves the church to start the mission that leads from Jerusalem way back then to Sutherland and Green and Myrtle Creek and all over Douglas County. It all ends up here, and you're a part of that story. And we looked at what it means to take spiritual steps in your journey, and that's what creates momentum. Well, we're going to pick that story back up. We're going to do Acts part two. We're going to start in Acts chapter nine, but we're looking at this from how impact is made, that there can be little impact. You can do it by addition, or you can have exponential impact, because when one person impacts two, and those two people impact four, and those four people impact 16, you have exponential growth. So what happens is when disciples come and learn about the Bible, they go home and they have a little bit of a change. But when disciples make disciples, it's exponential. It changes the world. It's how the gospel got here to us. So that's what we're going to be looking at. To kind of set us up for this, I want you to do something for me. I want you to put your mind into this, this mode of someone you wouldn't expect would ever come to Christ. And watch this. I um, grew up in a rough and tumble Irish Catholic family. We all learned how to box and we were encouraged to uh, fight with our cousins and box with our cousins. I kind of just went off living my life. I told my mom I didn't want any part of her church. I didn't want any part of that in my life. I just was wanted to live pretty much like my dad did. I indulged myself in the, uh, in the rougher side of the element time. In fact, I would beat people up for being Christians just because I thought it was fun. I had a hard time thinking that, that God could forgive me for you know, knocking somebody's teeth out uh, for, you know, selling drugs to people and, and having to come back and beat them up for collecting it. I kind of wanted to make a, uh, a clean break and I had an opportunity to move out to Virginia. Tried to be a better person, you know, did my, all my very best. Uh, somehow I equated it, uh, if I was good for most part of the week, that uh, I could go out on the weekends and just get a little, little wild, and but I'd be all right. And then one night, and met some girls, put them on my motorcycle, and we were looking for this other party, and we happened to drive by a, a cop, said, hey, pull over, and I said, no. I, I tossed the girls off the motorcycle and, uh, and dashed out of there. And the police are like minutes behind me. They Luckily, they didn't see the fact that I went off into the woods, so I had a lot of time to sit there and think. I was freezing in the woods, and here I am talking to God, yelling, screaming at him, thinking about my grandmother praying for me, and there I wake up, I'm in the church parking lot. What kind of a dude throws girls off a motorcycle? Did, I, did that, you catch that? You know what's funny? In all of our minds, we have a list of people that you think to yourself, now that one, not even God could save that one. Think back to your fifth grade year, you know that one guy in your class? If you can't remember that guy in your class, you were that guy in your class, all right? I was the, I think I, I think when I saw people, I would think that guy would never, ever go to church. That would never become a follower of Jesus. And I was thinking about this as I was prepping, and I thought to myself, I think people thought that of me, too. And uh, I was, as I was watching that story about Michael, it reminded me of someone. It reminded me of a guy named John who grew up in a very similar home. His father was a sailor and a drunkard and had nothing to do with Jesus. And his mom was a devoted follower. And there we, he was pulled, John was pulled in two directions, one towards his mother and a follower of Jesus, and one towards the life of his father. Well, when John was seven years old, his mother died of tuberculosis, and the influence of the father took over, and John set sail with his father. In fact, at the age of seven, he began sailing with his father because there was nowhere else for him to go. And he spent some time in the Royal Navy, and after that, he spent much of his time, much of his life, running slave ships for the British from... West Africa to the New World, back and forth, making a ton of money. He was a drunk man who was a womanizer and a chaser. In fact, one of the things that he said about himself, he wasn't just someone who chose to do sin as much as possible with the highest hand, as he said. He also tried to seduce others to do it too. He was the kind of guy you would say would never become a follower of Jesus. His name, John Newton, was a man who was far from God and far from any chance that he would ever meet God. But he was reading a book called The Imitation of Christ while his ship was in a bitter storm. And in the middle of that storm, a massive hole was breaching the bottom of the boat and the water was coming in. And he cried out to God. He said, God, save us. 
And in the middle of that storm, the ship lurches to the left. That's the port, for those of you that don't sail. Lurches to the left, and all of the cargo shifts and blocks the hole and saves the ship. And then it drifts. You can call it drifting to safety, but it drifted into safety. And there he began to process, what does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus? And then he had a stroke, and it drew him further in. And over time, he realized the horrific nature of what he'd been doing as a slave trader. And he gave that life up and became an Anglican priest. Probably the most famous line that he wrote was that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. John Newton is the man who wrote Amazing Grace, and I think more than any man in history, he may have understood what grace meant because he knew how far he had been from it. As we pick up our story today, I want you to think of those people that seem so far from being a follower of Christ. Now, as we get set for this, there's going to be one key character that we're going to look at for the next seven weeks, and his name is Saul. At the top of your outline, I want you to write the word Saul. Then I want you to write an equal sign. Then I want you to write the word Paul. We are going to get confused if we don't bring clarity. At the beginning of the story, his name is Saul. God changes his name to Paul, and so we don't get confused. Tonight, he will be Saul. In a few weeks, when you come back, he will be a different name, okay? So let's clarify that right now. A little background for you. When we were leaving Acts Part 1 in the Momentum series, there was a massive problem. The church had grown from 120 to 3,000, from 3,000 to 5,000, from 5,000 to 9,000. It had become a mega church, and it was all centered in Jerusalem. Well, a man named Stephen, a powerful man of God, had given his life to Jesus, and he stood up against the religious leaders of the time, and he said, what you're doing is not right, and they said, kill that man. And so they stoned him, and they started a persecution looking for all 9,000 of those people. And when they did that, they set out in that persecution, everybody scattered. Only the 11 people who were most closely committed to Christ, those who had walked for three years with him, um, those who, Matthew and John and Bartholomew, those people stayed stayed with them in, is, in Jerusalem. Everyone else scattered. And if you remember this map, they went everywhere. Well, the persecution lasts as long as those people get to the, till they get out of town. But then the persecution escalates. And a guy named Saul, who was a man probably around 30 years old, maybe a little bit younger. So he was a young man. He went to the religious leaders and said, hey, I got an idea. Let's take care of this persecution and let's expand it beyond Jerusalem. And that's where we're going to pick this up. So at the beginning of Acts chapter 9, you can turn there in your Bible. I um, would love it if you could do it on your phone. You can do it in paperback version. I always like paperback because you can write in it better. So we're going to pick it up there. If you don't have a Bible, I'll tell part of the story and a lot of it will be up on the screen. So here's where we pick it up. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He goes to the chief priests, those people who are in charge, and he gets permission to go to the nearest major metropolitan area, which is Damascus, current day Syria, right up here. It's not that far away. If we go back to this other map, you will see uh, we're actually looking at a small um, distance that he's going to travel, but he's going to go to Damascus. He's heard that there are followers of Jesus there, and he says, it is time to take them out. Now, on his way there, on the road to Damascus from Jerusalem, going around the Sea of Galilee and headed towards Damascus, when he's almost there, he has an encounter, one that will change his life, one that will change the followers of Jesus, and one that will change the course of the church forever, because he has an interaction with none other than Jesus Christ. Watch what happens here. Jesus Christ shows up, a bright light shows in front of him, and he falls to the ground, which I love the picture of this. This man who had so much vigor, so much credibility in his, uh, with his people, falls to the ground which is a sign of humility. Whether he meant to or not, I do not know. But either way, he ends up on the ground. And he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now notice there, Jesus says to him, you are persecuting me. Now Jesus has risen from the dead and he's not physically being hurt by Saul, but Saul is attacking the church. And Jesus so identifies with the church in Damascus, in Jerusalem, in Sutherland, in Green, and those of you watching online, all of us, he so identifies that when the church is being persecuted, he says, you're doing it to me. That's, a, that's better feel good. That if you're persecuted, Jesus feels it too. And he says, Saul, what are you doing? Who are you, Lord? Saul responds. And what a moment. You hear a voice. 
He's on his way to do what he thinks is the right thing. And instead, this voice says, you're persecuting me. And then he says who he is. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. Well, here's the fascinating thing about this. As he does this, when he gets up, he's actually blinded. Beautiful, beautiful moment. This type A driven personality, this dominant leader, the man who at a young age can get permission from the chief priest, from the religious leaders to go out and do these amazing things, is now so humbled that he is led by the hand. In fact, it says there in uh, verse 8 that so the people that had come with him, they saw the light, but they didn't, they, and they heard the noise, but they didn't see anybody. They led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days, Saul is stuck there. He cannot see. He chooses not to eat or drink. He has seen God. He has seen Jesus, and he has no idea what to do next. Well, the beautiful thing about this is at the very moment that God is speaking into the life of Saul, who will become Paul, he also goes to another follower in Damascus and says, I have a role for you to play in this game. And so the Lord told, his name's Ananias, by the way. So Ananias was in Jerusalem when the persecution broke out. He scattered. He ended up in Damascus. And this is what the Lord said to him. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man uh, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Now, this is really interesting. God says to him, in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias, that's you, buddy, come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, picture Ananias. You know, you're a follower of Jesus. You've already been per persecuted where you have not been able to stay in Jerusalem. With the rest of the church, everyone's been scattered. And here you are, you're in Damascus, and God comes and says to you, hey, here's what I need you to do. I need you to get up, go across town, uh, straight street, there's a house uh, owned by Judas, you know the one. Uh, Saul from Tarsus is there. What would you feel if you were Ananias? You know who this dude is. In fact, listen to what Ananias says. Uh, he has come here, um, Ananias says, this is a bad idea. I don't know what you're thinking, Jesus, but let's do something different. And this is what he says, he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest. This is his mission. He's here to kill us all, to arrest all who call on your name. So Ananias has a conversation with Jesus, says, hey, dude, bad idea. Let's not do it. And if you think back a couple of weeks, do you remember when Jonah was given a hard assignment and Paul talked about the difficult process that he had to grow through in that? Well, Ananias is a little more astute than that. He's a little more connected with what Jesus is trying to do. He listens when Jesus responds. Ananias says, this is why he's here. He's here to arrest us. And Jesus says, mm, yeah, that may be your plan, but that's not my plan. Or that may be his plan, but that's not my plan. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. And I love, I, whenever you see a verb in Scripture, look for it and circle it. Because it, it's where the action is. And then if you ever see an exclamation point and Jesus is talking, that's a heavy-handed thing, okay? Jesus says, go. I think there's a long pause there. This man is my chosen instrument. And now look, remember what Ananias said? It was to, to arrest everybody? Jesus says, no, 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 no. He is my instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And so Ananias, now this is so key. Unlike Jonah, look at Ananias' response. Remember I said, look at the verbs. Then Ananias went. This is so key. And if we just break this back down to our momentum series, you will never take spiritual steps unless when Jesus says to go, you go. So he says go, Ananias went. That is the first step in this. It's just flatline obedience. But here's what you're going to see through the rest of this sermon series. We'll get a little, little spoiler alert. Is you will find that an exponential life is one that helps other people take spiritual steps. And so Ananias goes to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road uh, as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. What a moment. And at that moment, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Now, what, what I want to talk about is from two separate perspectives. I want to talk about spiritual blindness. One from the life of Saul and one from the life of Ananias. I don't think we know how blind we are. Saul had no idea how blind he was to what God had called him to, to who God was, to where he was going in his life. 
I, I was thinking about just the impact that blindness can have and how quickly and easily it can be, become part of our hearts. When I was growing up, my father and my grandfather were both pastors, and they were pastors in the type of church that was one, it's called a congregational church, which meant that everyone voted on everything. If you wanted to change the color of the carpet, everyone voted. And if everyone voted, then the job of the pastor was not spiritual guidance, it was not leadership. The role of the pastor was to curry votes, to politic, to get 51% to agree and then head in a direction. But when you did that, if you got 51% to go with you, it meant 49 were against you. And I watched that my entire growing up. You know what I learned from that? I learned to hate the church. See, when all you see is how they treat you, and, and, and it gets personal too, because it wasn't just that they fought, but how they treated dad. And I know that's how they treated my granddad. Because I know Papa had ulcers from those horrible business meetings. And I learned very early to hate the church. But here's the problem with that. I fell in love with Jesus. And you can't fall in love with Jesus and hate his bride because it's his bride. And you don't go up to a man and say, man, I love you, but your wife's a real dog. You don't, you don't do that. And this is where I was in my heart. I love this Jesus guy and I couldn't stand the church, but I knew I was supposed to go. So when I left for college, I landed at a sweet spot. I ended up at Living Waters Foursquare Church in Medford, Oregon. I uh, was given directions on how to get there. The girl that I met that gave me the directions gave me the wrong directions. I read them wrong and went to the right place. What a mo This is the hand of God leading me there. And I walked in and I found a brotherhood of people that were willing to challenge me. Some of the most embarrassing moments in my life at church happened there. But they loved me past it. They love me dearly. And I remember I, I had graduated from college and I was moving up to Roseburg because I was going to be a teacher at the Christian school here. And it was on a Tuesday. I was moving on a Thursday and I was driving by the church and I was coming from the back way, a way I normally don't come. And no one was there. And I, there's a four-way stop. And I just stopped and I had a moment to just look at this place. And I just evaluated in my heart, what was that place? And remember, hate the church. You know what? The one sentence I had for that place, Living Waters Four Square Church, in Medford, that was the place I was loved. And you see, what was happening is over the course of those two years, the spiritual blindness that I had to who the bride of Christ is intended to be and who it is in God's eyes and who it was meant for me to be a part of, something like scales fell from my eyes. You see, I was spiritually blind, and I think Saul was too. And what I want us to look at is where are the places in our hearts where what God says and what we believe and what we view the world as are quite simply wrong. The idea that God would open the eyes of our hearts. One of the ways that I see that God opened Saul's eyes is he was blind to his brokenness. You see, Saul thought he was one of the most passionate followers of God. He was a, a Jew of all Jew. He was a Pharisee. He had the highest education to be a follower of Old Testament God there was. The problem was Jesus had come and his thought was my job is to protect the Old Testament God from Jesus, not knowing that the New Testament Jesus is that God. And so he set out with all this passion thinking when he left Jerusalem to catch his flight to Damascus that he thought he was on God's side and in the road. He's knocked to the ground and Jesus says, what are you doing? You are persecuting me. You see, one of those lines that John Newton wrote, he said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. John Newton knew he was a wretch. Paul, Saul, had no idea. He thought he was God's gift to Israel. And there on the ground in, in Damascus, right before he gets to the city, he finds out the truth. You are so broken. Here's what you need, Saul. You need me to save you from your sins. You need me to die on a cross and rise from the dead. Here's what you need. You need a taste of the real God. And what that means? You need to know how broken you are. You are not God's gift to humanity. It's funny, uh, the beauty of the life of Saul slash Paul is that he wrote 
most of the New Testament. And he wrote them in letters to other people. And one of them, he's writing to a guy that he mentors. The young guy's name is Timothy. And at the very beginning of the first letter he writes to him, in, in chapter 1, he said, here's a noteworthy saying. It's worth remembering that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now that makes sense, right? And then he says, comma, of whom I am the worst. Saul, on the road to Damascus, thought he was all that and a bag of potato chips. Later, after he sees Jesus, he finds out the truth. No, I am broken. He, he calls himself the worst of sinners, where at the beginning he would have said, I am the greatest. Not only did you see this in Timothy, I, one of the things I thought was so powerful is 30 years later, he writes a a letter to a church in Ephesus, which is in, uh, in, a, in a Greek city-state. And this, look at what he says here. It's actually one of those songs that is, was really, really a powerful song that we, the church sang if, about uh, 15 years ago. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, or may the eyes of your heart be open, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his glory in his holy people. The entire idea in writing that letter, I always wondered, when he wrote that letter, did he think back to the road to Damascus and that moment when the eyes of his heart were open? I love the symmetry and the, the irony of this, that he walked from Jerusalem to Damascus spiritually blind. He got up off that road and walked into Damascus physically blind, but spiritually seeing. He understood he was no longer blind to who Jesus was, but he couldn't see a thing physically. I love the irony of that. He had a mark on him. He couldn't just put that off. He had a physical problem to reflect the spiritual problem that he had before. One of the other things that he was blind to, it wasn't just his brokenness. He was blind to who God really is. And let me tell you this, everything in your theology, in your view of your life, in your view of everything comes down to this one question. What have you done with Jesus? What do you believe about him and how does that impact your life? If Jesus is just a good man, he's, a, he's nobody. If Jesus is just a good teacher, he's nobody. If he is not God in the flesh, as he says in John 1, he is Nobody. He is everything or he is nothing. And what you do with that changes everything. And that's what he finds right there. And look what it says. When he says this, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Let me clarify for you. What you're doing to the church, you are doing to me and I am God. What you do with Jesus affects everything. So we see that he is blind to his brokenness. We see he is blind to who God is. I also believe that he's blind to his destiny. Why did he leave Jerusalem? He had a job to do. Think through the beauty of this. His job was to destroy the church. After he meets Jesus, his job is to lead the church. If that's not a 180, what is? Think about that. The guy woke up in the morning thinking, I'm going to kill them all. Not so much. Now he will be one of the key leaders who will, he will travel without a motor, without a, um, a car, without an airplane. He will travel over 10,000 miles taking the name of Jesus that he was trying to destroy. And he will lead the charge to take it all over the known world, including into the Roman Empire, which will become Western Europe, which will become the new world that links you all the way to today. Saul, who came to destroy, had a very different destiny. And I ask you this, when you woke up this morning and you looked at the destiny that you thought you had before you, was Jesus at the center of it? If not, you're going nowhere. So let me ask you this question, where are you going? Where you are going is completely determined by who's leading you and where your eyes are. If it ain't Jesus, it ain't nothing. That's really bad grammar. Don't, don't write that one down, okay? So... You know, as I was looking at this, this entire idea of the transformation here, there's this really interesting component that I was thinking about. The church was being destroyed by this man. Well, think of just the 11 disciples, those people who were still in Jerusalem. Those people spent three years with Jesus, which meant they were with him when Matthew 5 was written. Matthew 5 is where Jesus, Matthew 5 through 7 is a sermon that Jesus gives. They call it the Sermon on the Mount. And in that sermon, you know what he says to all of those people, including those 11 disciples? He says to them, oh, I'll actually show it to you. He, he says to them, you know, this whole idea of love your neighbor, I've got something bigger. 
I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Which means that those 11 people remember Jesus telling them, hey, when you're persecuted, pray for that person. So I wonder, did the disciples pray for Saul? Think, think about the symmetry of this. They were told, if they, if they didn't, they were told to. They were told, whoever is persecuting you, pray for them. So let me ask you a question. Who are you praying for? I want you to write that one down. Who am I praying for? In your work, it may be in your home. Who is the most difficult person in your life? It may be a distant relative. It could be a neighbor. It could be someone that is your boss. It could be someone that's working under you. Who is the most difficult person? Here's what Jesus said. And here's what we see happen in the life of Saul. The man no one would have guessed would have become a follower of Jesus becomes a follower. You may get to play a role in someone's life like that. Well, not only do we see the blindness of Saul, Ananias had a little conversation with Jesus, didn't he, as well? And in that conversation, we see some blindness that he has. When you look at the life of Saul and his blindness, a lot of the questions I have, I realize that so much of that is really similar to someone who's really checking Jesus out. Ananias is a very churched person. So if you've been around the church for a while, Ananias' blindness may be more similar to yours. But I want to look at this. Ananias' blindness. What was it that was hard for him in this? One of the things that I see is that he was blind. He was blinded by his past. I, I'm going to do a little inferring here, but if, if you just take the, the timeline of, of history here, that Jerusalem had the only church and it had about nine to 10,000 people and then a persecution came and everyone scattered. The time between that and when Saul goes to attack at Damascus would not have been long enough for a church to be planted and have people lead others to Christ, which meant Ananias had been, most probably had been in Jerusalem. He knew who Saul was and he knew to be afraid. What I am so impressed by is that Saul gets permission and heads to Damascus. How did the news get there ahead of time? I mean, this is way before Twitter. I mean, not joking here. It's before there's any type of social media, but somehow there's some sort of pipeline of information. People in Damascus were scared because they knew Saul was coming. There is fear involved here because whenever you have a past that blinds you, I'm, I can't guarantee this, but I think most of the time, if you have a past that blinds you, your fear will blind you as well. You see, what you're afraid of reflects the place where you need the greatest growth of faith. And so there is Ananias who says, we have a problem here. The entire premise of his trip is to come and arrest us. You want me to go to him. That doesn't make any sense. You, you see the tension and the fear there. I'm fine. I'm just going to live too much coffee. I'll be all right. I, don't, I shouldn't have any coffee. The idea that I am afraid, I will not go, is a place, the exact place where there needs um, faith to grow. Look at what it says here. He says, and he came here with authorities from the chief priest. Why? That scares me to arrest. And then Jesus responds, no, it's different. It's to proclaim. You realize that Jesus spoke peace and faith into the very place where this fear resigned? One of the, the questions I'd ask you is when you have a place of fear where it's it is so hard to say, I want to trust God with it. Do you allow him to speak into that? Because what I find is that there is a thing that follows along with that blindness. It's also just deafness. Is that the very place where we need Jesus to speak into us, to open our eyes, is exactly where I don't want to look. It's exactly where I don't want to listen to him. It's exactly what Jesus spoke to him. That place of fear is the very place where you have to take a step. And this is the difference between not just momentum and a personal step. This is also about an exponential life. You will be helping someone else take a step in their journey. This changes everything. Do you know how many times Ananias is mentioned after this? Less than one. But he plays a role in bringing the Apostle Paul into the game. What beauty. Because everything changes when you allow Jesus to speak in the place of your fear. And the third thing that I notice is not only is he blinded by his past and he's blinded by his own fear, he's also blinded of his own view of grace. Because when you look at grace, you think to yourself, I look at that guy and I know he can't be saved. There are limitations on what God can do. There's only so much that can happen. And God's grace can't do 
that much. You know, as you're talking about this, I, I, I know what you're talking about. I, I remember, uh, I think it was 2003, and we'd been meeting for breakfast oh, for a year or so, and, mm -hmm. and you were teaching at the Christian school, and you were really impassioned, and God was using you there. And, and uh, I remember at breakfast one morning, you, you looked at me and you said, Paul, what would it take for me to be a pastor at Family Church? I remember. <laughs> I remember your response, too. <laughs> Way to make it awkward, Paul. And, and I don't remember what I said. But Nothing. I, he went. <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking, this is the 23-year-old guy at the time that if I didn't watch him, he would tackle me on the front lawn. and Back lawn, you know, too. I, any lawn. Come into the room, opinion first, mouth first, and... And I, and I seriously was thinking, what it would take? A miracle. That's what it would take. And I was thinking, you know, we talk about God working in people's lives and how we get them caught in the past of how we see them. And, and I know how that works because God changed both of us. Mm -hmm. And I remember like 2007, a couple years later, mm -hmm. and we were sitting having this conversation and and you said, Paul, what it would look like if I were to apply for the children's pastor at Family Church. And I, so what's funny, you didn't say anything there either, but there's two different looks that Paul has. One of them like, this is awkward. The other one is when he likes what you say or he's intrigued or something special happened, his eyebrows go like this. <laughs> and that time, your eyebrows moved. Because I was thinking, what a perfect place. That would be so good for you. And I realized that God had done a lot of work in you, and you had grown and developed. But God had done a lot of work in me, too. And that in our time together and spending time talking about ministry, you know, I remember many things that you've said to me that challenged me about how to lead and how to speak. And, and that God had worked in both of us to where three and a half years later, it was like, yeah, that would be awesome. Because God does that kind of work. One of the things that, that, that I saw in that, though, you didn't have me trapped here. Yeah. You know, you didn't say, you know, you tackled me once, <laughs> and you're going to pay for that. And I had white pants on, and you took them out. Yeah, well, <laughs> who wears white pants on a lawn? Seriously. <laughs> That's on you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you look at that, that idea, um, one of the things that when uh, Paul and I were walking around here at the Sutherland campus, to tell you this, Green, um, people here went... What is going on? How come the two of you are in the same building? You know why the two of us are in the same building? Because there's someone that we apprenticed in green. And Jason's there taking the lead there. In fact, this is what we want to really challenge, us, challenge each other to, is this idea of the view of grace. But we have a couple um, next steps that we want you to, to think through. One of them is that the very next thing that Paul did in verse, 19, or verse 18 is that he got baptized. And next week at both campuses, we're having a baptism. And if that's something you want to be a part of, you can sign up at either lobby. There's a class in, at, at Sutherland on the 29th and in Green on the 29th. So if you want to be a part of that, you can. But look at these questions that, that we really want to challenge you to. One of them is we want to ask a friend to point out a blind spot in your life. I think one of the things that made such a huge difference in our relationship and in seeing you grow is Will is an incredibly teachable person. And I am not really that good at confronting, but Will would invite those kind of conversations. And, and I, I always regretted it for a little <laughs> bit, just if you're wondering. It always hurt. And he would invite me to say, how do you think I'm doing? Or what's going on in my life? And, and I remember sitting down in my office one time with you and, and uh, asking him, do you know what the word iconoclastic means? I didn't, by the way. <laughs> this is no extra charge. This is a wonderful word. Iconoclastic is somebody who just likes to smash things that are established just to see them break. Like icons, you just like to knock them off. And, and I said, you know, sometimes, Will, you come across just willing to attack any idea that's established instead of coming across thoughtful or, or some way that you believe that we need to change. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you took that so well. And you actually went back later and said, I see that I'm doing that here, and I see how I do that there. What's it, interesting about that, though, is I've never seen a model of humility like Paul. Um, I mean, for, for a man of your age, <laughs> to, yeah, I said it, I did it. 
for a man who was older than me, and if you look back, so I'm 23, and at the time, you know, you were 31. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you were older than I was, and you were willing to let me say, hey, you know, when you do this, I don't think you know, you, were allow you allowed me to speak into blind spots as well. And for you to be willing to do that at a seasoned place in life, to listen to some young punk, um, even I guarantee you I didn't say it with grace and tact, and you still were willing to, to hear that. Um, so here's what we like to ask you on this. It takes humility to say, hey, what do you see in me? Um, if you really want a challenge, ask your spouse. The idea being that they would point out something in you where there is some blindness. And let me tell you, any type of relational blindness echoes out of a spiritual blindness. There's something that you're seeing improperly in God, and it comes out in how you relate to others. The other uh, challenge we have is the example that Paul has lived out as well as any man I know. We want you to find someone to disciple. And after you write the word disciple, we want you to add a word in there. We want you to add the word mentor. I asked our life group, I said, how do these words, how, how do they feel to you? Disciple, mentor, coach. And they kind of had a feeling like the word disciple meant somebody that tells you everything that's wrong with you and then you feel bad. A and a mentor is somebody who comes alongside of you and helps you to grow. And we want you to get that idea with the word disciple. And I, and I would definitely want to say to you that there's a lot of people here who have years of experience, you've walked with the Lord, there are so many young people and young couples and young adults that need somebody to come alongside and to listen to them and to love them and to ask them good questions and to graciously let them grow. And the cool part of it that you don't even realize at the beginning is you will grow and learn as much as they do. And I think of how many times, I mean, Will said to me one time, you know, he said, you know, you are almost quotable. <laughs> I'm such a jerk. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. <laughs> And his point was great. It's like I talk around things instead of staying with them in a, in a distilled and memorable fashion. And you know what? That's been my goal since that time. I want to be more quotable. I want to say it clearly and distinctly. And it's always this mutual growth process that I think just God loves. And with that same idea, as we release to the Green Campus, I want to say that to you, Jason. Um, I've had a hard week, and you have been someone who is caring for me, and you've been sending me scriptures and praying for me. And I'm grateful. I love you guys in green, and we'll see you next time. Let's go ahead and pray for them. Why don't you pray for um, everyone for this blind spot idea, and then I'll pray for them on who yeah. they might step into. Father, thank you that you are gracious with us. And if you showed us everything we didn't see right at once, mm -hmm. it would be overwhelming. But you gently and yet repeatedly and insistently want us to see you and, and the world and others like you do. And so, Father, give us courage to admit that we don't have it all together, to admit that we may be looking at things wrongly, to admit, God, that we sometimes need other people to point out things that we can't see. And I ask that you would give us not just the <coughs> humility, but the deep desire to grow so much that I'm willing to be humble, because that's what it takes. God, I just pray for, um, for this idea of an exponential life, that we would pick people and we would see people and we would be willing to disciple them and have the courage to say, hey, would you meet with me? Would you like to connect with me? That we would be willing to help people move from where they are in their spiritual journey to take that next step, to help students move into becoming servants and servants to become stewards, that we would help people in their journey. Um, God, I pray for those right now who are, um, this is a really scary thing. I pray that you would help them move past the past, past the fear, to see what grace really is and help them move into trusting you in the middle of this process. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.